just have to use your imaginations, it's okay. So I'm going to talk to you, so last time I talked about transmission, and this time I'm going to talk about the contents of the secret doctrine more. I'm going to talk about the rounds and races, but this means that by necessity I'm going to be talking about reincarnation because <coughs> reincarnation is kind of ubiquitous in the theosophical cosmos. And when we think of reincarnation, we normally think of a person dying and being reborn as somebody else. Um, but in theosophy, reincarnation is a much broader concept that includes human rebirth among many other forms of rebirth. So it's a bit like a fractal. You all know what a fractal is, right? You can imagine like what a picture of, okay, so I'll explain. So in maths, a fractal is an infinite pattern created by an equation, um, but many natural phenomena such as, I had a picture of Rom Romanesco broccoli, um, many natural things like leaves or other natural phenomena are fractal to some degree. So in a fractal, the same pattern occurs again and again, but on, uh, on, a, on different scales. So similarly, in HPB's cosmos, universes reincarnate, planetary systems reincarnate, and so too do entire human races. In other words, the same pattern that appears in a larger scale, as in the reincarnation of universes, is repeated on a smaller and smaller <coughs> scale. So in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about what that means. I'm going to start by looking at the subject with the widest possible lens, as it were, to um, examine reincarnation from a kind of cosmic perspective. And then I'm going to zoom in to look at aspects related to our local planetary system. And then finally, I'm going to zoom in again to look at processes that are particular to this Earth. So the lecture is going to be technical in that we're going to explore in detail the teachings of HPB, but it's also going to have a personal element because I'm going to conclude by reflecting on some of the spiritual insights that I perceive in these teachings and inviting you to add your own too. So let's start with reincarnation on the largest possible scale. HBB teaches that our universe isn't the only universe that exists. It's part of a cosmic chain of universes. Our universe arose after the previous one disappeared and that earlier universe had appeared after the demise of the one that went before as well. In other words, just like people, universes die and in a sense are reincarnated. During its lifetime, each universe repeatedly manifests and then disappears. And HPB says this can be likened to the universe waking up and then sleeping. So what's the point of all these cosmic cycles? Well, according to HPB, that's just how the universe evolves. But perhaps a bit more intriguingly, she explains that evolution leads to the divine's achievement of increasing self-consciousness. Even though we all understand the words that I just said about divine self-consciousness, I consider this statement to represent a great mystery that can be quite awe-inspiring if you stop to think about it for a minute. Universes are living entities that are made of two substances, spirit and matter which in reality are two aspects of the same single substance, although we can't perceive that from our current state of consciousness. In HPB's own words, so do spirit and matter stand to each other, the two poles of the same homogeneous substance, the root principle of the universe. Spirit and matter are simultaneously repelled and attracted to one another. And if this sounds a little bit like a romantic relationship, then it might not be an accident. As HBB says that consciousness comes into being at a specific point in the development of our universe, and that this happens through the union of spirit with matter. In other words, we could say that consciousness is like the child of spirit and matter. So my reading of spirit and matter is a sort of divine couple is strengthened when we look at what HPB says about what links them 
which is something called Fohat. Fohat works like a bridge that allows divine ideas to affect the material world as laws of nature. But HPB writes about Fohat in terms of eros, or sexual attraction, and she characterizes it as a kind of affinity. Now, affinity was a word that was very popular in the spiritualist movement at the time of HPB's writing. The idea was that two people could have a special spiritual affinity and that this was why they would feel a sexual attraction for one another. It was a bit controversial because some, spirit, some spiritualists used this idea of affinity um, to say that they discovered the person that they were really supposed to be with and it was not their husband or their wife. So historians say that spiritualism was a site for all kinds of Victorian transgressions. It was a bit of a controversial sphere. This might have been one reason why HPB didn't like it so much, but it's certainly not the only reason. But in any case, right here, it's worth noting that HPB is using a term that was popularized by the spiritualists and that contemporary readers would have understood it to signify sexual attraction, a point that HPB makes quite clear when she refers to Fohat as divine love. So getting back to her cosmology, the universe starts out in a state of cosmic rest, and from there, spirit falls into matter and has to find its way back to its original condition. In other words, matter has to become spirit again. HPB calls the change from spirit to matter involution and from matter to spirit evolution. Let's pause for just a second because everybody today has an understanding of what evolution is, right? We learn about it in school. We know the creationists disagree with it. I won't be dealing with all of HPB's views on evolution here because it's just beyond the scope of this lecture. But I do want to know that in theosophy, something very specific is meant by the term evolution. And it doesn't necessarily correspond with what the average person thinks about that topic, although in some ways it might. What happens when spirit involves into matter? Like basically, it appears, but as it evolves, it disappears again, it spiritualizes. HPB described the periodic appearance and then disappearance of the universe as the outbreathing and the inbreathing of the great breath. The Sanskrit term for this period, meaning one complete outbreath and one complete inbreath, is a manvantara. And during the outbreath, that is the involutionary phase, the impersonal divine source, known in Sanskrit as Parabrahman, <coughs> emits mula prakriti, which is the Sanskrit word for matter. Blavatsky describes it as undifferentiated matter, and it's a kind of pre-cosmic substance. But it doesn't stop there because, as HPB explains, universes have different levels or layers. Her description of this process is a version of what's known as emanationism, a philosophical theory in which the divine continually emanates into the various levels of the cosmos it produces without diminishing itself in any way. And in the slide, I had a picture of a champagne fountain to illustrate this. Um, it's a bit like the champagne fountain because the champagne cascades from the bottle into the glass and then fills, fills all the glasses that are underneath. But in the, th in the theory of emanation, the champagne bottle never empties. It's kind of continually going. So this is an idea that can be found in different versions, in Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and Kabbalah, and these are all currents that HPP discusses as part of her work. In HPP's version of emanationism, after the divine emits mula prakriti, or undifferentiated matter, the first or unmanifested logos um, emerges. This is followed by the second logos, sometimes referred to as the demiurge, which is a term taken from Gnosticism. This second logos is really an aggregate or an army of sentient beings called Jan Chohans who function 
as the architects of the universe. What does it mean that they're the architects? According to HPB, as part of the universe's development, the first Logos has the idea, <coughs> and then the Jan Chohans draw up the plan. She explains that they are the same as the angels in Christianity, the Elohim of Jewish scriptures, and the Jani Buddhas of Buddhism. Jan Chohans are more evolved than us, that is, they are more spiritualized, but one day we too will have evolved into Jan Chohans. After the second Logos of the Jan Chohans, the next emanation is the universal soul, the source of a finite number of what HPB calls monads, which can loosely be translated as spirits. The monad is the immortal reincarnating principle within us. So she describes this universal soul as a compound unity of manifested living spirits, the parent source and nursery of all the mundane and terrestrial monads. In the early stages of evolution, the monads are constituted of two principles, atma, and something that allows Atma to function in the cosmos, a principle called Buddhi, which HPB describes as Atma's vehicle. I don't, have to go in, I don't have time to go into all the seven principles here, except to say that Atma is the divine principle and that it's not a self in any conventional sense, but instead what we might think of as the divine that we all share in. In HPB's words, the monads are not discrete principles, limited or conditioned, but raised from that one universal absolute principle. She explains the entrance into a dark room through the same aperture of one ray of sunlight followed by another will not constitute two rays, but one ray intensified. Monads enter the cycle of incarnation at the beginning of the universe's Manvantara, and they're repeatedly born and they die and they're reborn again in different forms. First as minerals, then as plants, then as animals, and then various types of pre-human and human being. When I say reborn here, I mean this in a fairly loose sense with reference to the early stages of evolution because during those periods, monads are not differentiated from one another in the way that they will later be. And they don't incarnate into, but rather kind of overshadow changing material forms. At the same time, these mineral, vegetable, and animal forms, or proto-forms, more accurately, evolve physically. Concurrently, the associated monad spiritualizes. At a certain point in their development, the monads become conscious through the blending of spirit with matter. This is a very important juncture in the evolutionary trajectory, and it's at this point that the monad becomes what HPV calls a man in the technical sense. She explains that the monad isn't a man until the light of the logos is awakened in him. Until then, he should not be referred to as a man, but has to be regarded as a monad imprisoned in ever-changing <coughs> forms. For this man, for this man to develop, the monad has to acquire a spiritual model or prototype. For this, it needs, and I quote, an intelligent consciousness to guide its evolution and progress, neither of which is possessed by the homogeneous monad or by senseless, though living, matter. The atom of dust requires the soul of life to be breathed into him. This is where the Jan Chohans or Pitris come in. Again, in HPB's own words, the occult doctrine teaches that while the monad is cycling on downwards into matter, these very Elohim or Pitris, the lower Jan Chohans, are evolving Paripasu with it on a higher and more spiritual plane, descending also relatively into matter on their own plane of consciousness when, after having reached a certain point, they will meet the incarnating senseless monad encased in the lower, lowest matter and blending the two potencies, spirit and matter, the union will produce, what is, uh, will produce 
that terrestrial symbol of the heavenly man in space, perfect man. So at the beginning of this lecture, I suggested a reading in which spirit and matter were a couple and consciousness was their child. If you'll permit me to continue with my simile, then at this stage of evolution, the Jan Chohans function as the matchmakers, bringing together spirit and matter. These two then give birth to consciousness and man awakens. Once conscious, the man continues evolving. To cut a very long story short, if all goes well, the man eventually, the man gradually becomes aware of the impermanent and illusory nature of the cosmos and is eventually reabsorbed into the impersonal divine absolute. HBB calls this reabsorption parinirvana. Parinirvana is followed by a pause called a pralaya, during which the universe rests before repeating the whole process once more. According to HPB, then, all life participates in this vast reincarnationary journey. <coughs> Those of us incarnated as humans were previously animals, plants, and so forth, and those who are incarnated as Jan Chohans were once people. But even the Jan Chohans have not finished evolving and will eventually go on to become even more spiritual beings. Evolution, HPB maintains, is endless. Once the process has been completed here, this universe will die and the next universe will be born where further evolution will take place. The process can be likened to an evolutionary fractal, a great cosmic pattern that's repeating itself endlessly. So that's cosmic evolution. Let's zoom in now to take a look at what happens to the monad on its planetary journey. And this is one of the more unusual aspects of theosophical teaching. HPV claims that our solar system is not the only one that exists. Each of the planets that we know about, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, has its own, is part of its own system of seven globes. Each, there's a visible globe and there are six invisible globes. These invisible globes is it exist on different planes of reality. In HBB's own words, they are blended with our world, interpenetrating it, and are in a, interpenetrated by it. The Earth with its six invisible globes is called the Earth chain. HBB assigns each globe within that chain a letter from A to G with the Earth as globe D. Now I'm gonna have to ask you to use your powers of visualization, which I hope are well practiced. <laughs> Um, does everybody know what that diagram looks like? You should imagine a kind of a, a circle of globes with the Earth at the bottom as globe D and then three on either side, um, the more spiritual globes. And she assigns a letter to each one. So it goes from your point of view, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like that. So within the Earth chain, evolution starts on globe A, and then it goes to globe B, and then C, and then D, which is this, this Earth. Globe A is the most spiritual. B is slightly less spiritual, a little more material. Again, the same with C until you get to D, which is the most material, and then you start spiritualizing again on the other side. Does that make sense? I'm seeing some nods. I hope that makes sense. It's much better with a diagram. Okay, so what's the point of becoming less spiritual and more material only to spiritualize again? In fact, we'll not return to the same spiritual condition on the last globe that we experienced on the first one. We will have lived numerous lives as different kinds of beings on the seven globes and assimilated those experiences we'll have become more conscious and moved closer to absorption in the divine, which is our ultimate goal. In this sense, then, the two-dimensional diagram is misleading. Our involution and evolution are not best depicted as circular, but rather as spiral and as constantly progressing. It's just a diagram. Groups of monads evolve together 
In other words, we all have what we might call an evolutionary family. And HPB's term for this group is a life wave. She calls the journey of the life wave from the first to the last globe of the planetary chain around. Just as the universe has a Manvantara, which is an active period, followed by a Pralaya, which is a rest period, so does the planetary chain. Each time the family of monads completes a round, there's a period of rest called an obscuration. We travel around the planetary chain together with our life wave, seven times, resting in between each round. Those of us who are incarnated as humans on Earth today have completed three and a half rounds within the Earth chain. This means we've traveled from globe A to globe G three times and then made it back here to the Earth. There are going to be seven rounds in total, so we're at the midpoint. Once the life wave has been around all seven times, the planetary chain itself begins to die out, and this is called planetary dissolution. The life wave then transfers <coughs> to a new planetary chain. According to HPB, those of us who are now within the Earth chain previously evolved in the lunar chain, which is now abandoned. She explained, every such chain of worlds is the progeny and creation of another lower and dead chain, its reincarnation, so to say. So that was the planetary system. Let's zoom in once again and look at the Earth. How does evolution proceed here on the Earth? Blavatsky divides the evolution of human life on Earth into seven consecutive stages known as root races. We have to pass through each of these seven root races to complete our evolution. Previous root races lived on continents that no longer exist because they were destroyed by floods and earthquakes. HPB even hinted at the reincarnation of continents, writing that such is the fate of every continent, which, like everything else under the sun, is born, lives, becomes decrepit, and dies. As we know, in theosophy, Everything that dies is reborn, but only after a period of rest. And indeed, HPB explains that each continent with its root race appears and then disappears, and that there follows a period of rest before the next root race appears on a new continent. Evolution on the Earth began when Jan Chohans from the lunar chain, known as the lunar pitries, created the first root race by oozing them out of their bodies. This first root race was very ethereal, and it lived on a continent known as the imperishable sacred land. It was sexless, it couldn't be injured or die, and it multiplied by budding, rather like yeast, some corals or sponges. This first root race gradually turned into the more solid second root race, which lived on the Hyperborean continent. The second root race was intellectually inactive and was constantly plunged, HBB said, into what she called a kind of blank or abstract contemplation. Like the first root race, it was sexless and too ethereal to have left any physical remains. The third root race was the first to develop physical bodies. HBB called it the Lemurian race because it lived on a continent named Lemuria. I did have a slide that showed a map, a historical map, that contained Lemuria because in 19th century geology, Lemuria was a kind of hypothetical lost continent they believe must have existed in a certain place to account for certain similarities between, between species. According to HPB, the first Lemurians reproduced by exuding drops of sweat that became eggs. These eggs initially produced hermaphroditic beings, but very gradually they produced offspring in which one sex predominated over another. So that eventually male or female Lemurians were born. Some very important things happened during the Lemurian period. During the early part of it, 
higher beings produced those who would eventually become human adepts by a process called Kriya Shakti. These proto-adepts, referred to by HPB as the sons of will and yoga, remained apart from the rest of mankind. Then, around the midpoint of the Lemurian race, certain Jan Chohans endowed some Lemurians with the principle of manas or reason. Before they had been endowed with this manas, the Lemurians had been sinless because they didn't have egos, and without egos, they couldn't create any karma. Without karma, the death and rebirth process of the Lemurians had been a lot simpler. They would simply resurrect out of an old body into a new one. As soon as they were endowed with manas, however, they started creating karma, and their death and reincarnation took on more of a recognizable format. At the close of the third root race, the Lemurians looked like gigantic apes, but they could already think and speak and were relatively civilized. Nevertheless, some of them were morally irresponsible and mated with lower animals, creating the remote ancestor of today's ape. In other words, according to HPB, apes had evolved from men and not the other way around, as Darwinists claimed. The fourth root race lived on Atlantis. The Atlanteans were more intellectual than the Lemurians and their use of language was more advanced. They were shorter and they didn't live as long. During the highest point of their civilization, knowledge and intellectuality, the Atlanteans divided into those who followed the right-hand path and those who followed the left-hand path. One of the effects of this was that what had previously been the holy mystery of procreation gradually turned into an animal indulgence. What HPB called the curse of karma was called down on the Atlanteans. Humans, as we know them today, part of the fifth root race, which is known as the Aryan. HPB says that the Aryan race is descended from the Atlanteans whose ancestors were the more spiritual races of the Lemurians. After the submersion of the last remnant of the Atlantean race, HPB explains that an impenetrable veil of secrecy was thrown over the occult and religious mysteries. This secrecy led members of the Aryan root race to the establishment of traditions in which ancient truths might be taught to the coming generations under the veil of allegory and symbolism. So this then, is the origin of the secret doctrine. One of the most important points about the Aryan root race, according to HPB, is that it's positioned at the exact midpoint of the involutionary evolutionary process. A practical consequence of the fact that humanity is now just turning towards spiritualization is that phenomena such as thought transference, clairvoyance, <coughs> Clair audience and things like that are becoming more common. HBB says the sixth and seventh root races will come in the future, and she claims the germs of the sixth are already to be found in America. Once evolution has been completed through all the rounds and races of the Earth chain, the life wave of monads will find itself as free from matter and all its qualities as it was in the beginning having gained, in addition to the experience and wisdom, the fruition of all its personal lives without their evil temptations. The monads then become Jan Chohans. These Jan Chohans will be transferred in the next cycle to higher superior worlds, making room for a new hierarchy composed of the elect ones of our mankind. Highly evolved Jan Chohans move through our solar system in this way, until the time arrives for the cosmic pralaya when the entire cosmos will rest <coughs> before beginning again. So, to conclude, what does one do with all of this information? Can it possibly have any bearing on our own practice? One way of integrating these teachings into practice could be to meditate on the processes they describe 
such as visualizing these chains of living universes dying and being reborn, planetary chains with their invisible globes, and the progress of the root races accompanied by these geological catastrophes. We might imagine, as part of such meditations, how this Earth looked in the past and how it will look in 100, 1,000, or even a million years' time. At the same time, we might maintain an awareness that there is no dead matter in this universe and that it's all like one giant being composed of multiple smaller manifestations, a gigantic fractal entity. Visualizations like this, in my opinion or experience, can inspire a sense of wonderment and veneration, as well as an increased respect for the material world, because it's not dead matter. Everything is alive. Wow. And what about reincarnation? Reincarnation is generally thought of as a comforting doctrine. If someone you love has died, then you might feel reassured if you believe that they will soon be reborn. This idea could hold for the spiritualist version of reincarnation, but as we know, HPB disagrees with that. For HPB, the monad is reborn into a new personality as well as a new body each time it's reborn. So the person being reborn is different to the one who died. The rebirth also happens a very long time after the death that precedes it so that any loved ones expectantly awaiting the return will have long since died themselves. There are other impersonal features of Blavatsky's teachings too. For example, she insists that the divine is impersonal and not a god that can be spoken to or supplicated. Indeed, the whole cosmic scheme I've just described of reincarnating universes, planetary chains, continents, and races doesn't center on individuals. It's a vast evolutionary trajectory whose ultimate destination is more important than the details of any particular life. Can such an impersonal teaching about reincarnation and cosmic evolution provide any comfort or inspira inspiration as we face life's inevitable struggles? I believe that it can, because one of its main messages is that absolutely everything matters. Nothing in the cosmos is insignificant, not the life or death of even the smallest creature. Within the ever-progressing cosmic fractal in which everything reflects everything else, the life of every rock, fruit, or spiritual being is an integral part of a process that's eventually going to find its culmination in the divine's self-knowledge. Thus ever connected, all humans, animals, plants, and even minerals are the children of the universe and an intrinsic component of its evolving fabric. The teaching also stresses the importance of the evolutionary family and our kinship with everyone else, indeed with everybody alive. HPB's teaching remind us that we're all alike in our constitution. All of us contain a divine spark that's derived from and will return to the same source. Furthermore, we're all part of the same life wave, and therefore we're all more or less at the same level of evolution. If there are any differences between us in abilities or achievements, then these must be relatively small when imagined from the perspective, for example, of a much more advanced being like a Jan Chohan. It's an idea that just shouldn't leave much room for any attitude of superiority towards anybody else. Another theme within these teachings is the fundamental importance, evolutionarily speaking, of the present moment and the power of humanity to take its destiny in its hands right now. This can be empowering, but when HPB gives the impression that everything hinges on humanity's contemporary choices, we might also find it rather terrifying. What if collectively we make the wrong choices? And it seems that today fears like that are more common than ever. But theosophy contains an answer for that too, because although our actions in the present moment are important, it's also clear from the teachings that humanity and the cosmos are going to evolve anyway, because it has an inherent tendency to do so. 
So perhaps we don't need to worry so much after all. Thank you very much. <laughs>